Good afternoon everyone, my name is Deltlead and today we are going to break down how nuclear rocket engines work. Nuclear rockets are somewhat overlooked in the game, but the technology and the principles behind them are fascinating and they are highly undervalued in my opinion. In this video, I'm going to be breaking down the physics that enables nuclear engines to work, and the advantages and disadvantages of these nuclear rockets, and what they're good at doing. Now, before we get into this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The support you guys have been giving me has been amazing so far, and it's really inspired me to work hard to make better content for you. Now, let's get into it. To explain how a nuclear rocket works, we've got to zoom all the way in, and I mean all the way in. At its foundation, a nuclear rocket is a nuclear reactor. Fuel rods of uranium-plutonium sustain a fission reaction. Uranium-235 atoms are what are known as a fissile isotope, meaning if a U-235 atom absorbs a neutron, it can fission. Once absorbed, the uranium-235 is turned into an excited uranium-236 atom. If it's excited enough, the uranium atom will split into two fission fragments and emit prompt neutrons and gamma radiation. These fission products carry the energy released by the fission as a kinetic energy, then scatter off other atoms in the fuel, the cladding, and the moderator, depositing their kinetic energy and heating up the fuel. The heat is conducted from the fuel into the cladding and then from the cladding into the coolant. Now, each fission produces on average about two and a half new neutrons, which have an average energy of about two mega electron volts, or MeV. That's about 3.4 times 10 to the negative 16 joules. Now, that may seem like a tiny amount of energy, but these neutrons are tiny particles, and that tiny amount of energy allows them to travel about 20,000 kilometers per second. Because they're traveling so fast, they actually have trouble causing more fissions. They literally tend to zip right past and through the uranium without interacting with them, and only a few of these fast neutrons actually cause another fission to occur. The rest zip away so quickly, and they leak out of the reactor, or they're absorbed by non-fuel elements. This graph shows the probability of a neutron to cause a fission based on its energy. There are three regions of interest here that we use to describe the neutrons in a reactor. On the right side of this graph is the fast region. The spiky bit in the middle is what's called the resonance region, and on the left we have the thermal region. Immediately after the fission event, our neutrons are in the fast region. But as they move through the reactor, they can balance off of other atoms. These are called scattering interactions. In these scattering interactions, the neutrons begin to give away some of their energy and slow down. Once they've slowed down enough, we call them thermal neutrons. Thermalized neutrons, neutrons at lower energy levels that have already been slowed down, are much more likely to be absorbed by uranium. Now, in order to get our extra spicy fast neutrons to slow down and get the most thermal neutrons possible, we need a material that can slow down the neutrons really well without absorbing them. It turns out that hydrogen is really great at this. Hydrogen has nearly the same mass as a neutron because it's basically just a proton, and it can absorb a lot of the neutron's kinetic energy because their masses are very similar. We can visualize this in action using this physics simulation. If the two masses are identical, and the collision is totally elastic, meaning kinetic energy is conserved, then the first ball, in this case our neutron, should deposit all of its energy into the second ball, the hydrogen atom. So, hydrogen is an ideal moderator for our reactor, and you know what has a lot of hydrogen in it, and is super abundant and extremely cheap? Water. Water is also a very effective coolant because it has a high temperature coefficient. So, we pass water around our fuel rods to do two things. Absorb the thermal energy from the fuel rods and use it to do work and to keep the fuel rods from melting. And, to moderate our fast neutrons, helping us to sustain that nuclear reaction. If we remove the water, not enough neutrons can go on to cause more fissions and create more neutrons, and the reactor will shut down. Reactors can be in one of three states, subcritical, critical, or supercritical. When a reactor is subcritical, there are fewer neutrons in each cycle than the last. Fewer neutrons produce even fewer fissions, and the total number of neutrons in each population decreases exponentially. In a supercritical reactor, it's the exact opposite. There are more neutrons in each cycle than the last, and more neutrons means even more fissions and the neutron population increases exponentially. In a critical reactor, however, the number of neutrons being produced exactly cancels out the neutrons that leak out of the reactor. Perfectly balanced, as all things should be. In nuclear engineering, we have a unit of measurement to tell us how super or subcritical our reactor is. It's called reactivity. 
A negative reactivity means the reactor is subcritical, positive, supercritical, and if the reactivity is zero, then the reactor is critical. Most nuclear reactors have control rods, which absorb excess neutrons and can be used to control reactivity. But for our nuclear rocket, control rods just aren't feasible. They're very heavy and require a lot of additional systems to operate them. So instead of including these big metal control rods, we can actually use our fuel, which in this case is just plain old water, to be both our coolant, moderator, and our reactivity control system. By admitting more fuel, we can increase the amount of moderator in the core and thus increase the amount of fissions occurring, raising our power, or by cutting back on the amount of fuel flowing into the core, we can reduce the amount of moderator and thus reduce the number of fissions occurring, lowering our power. We know how the reactor works and produces energy now, but how do we use that energy to propel our rocket? Well, as discussed previously, the coolant absorbs thermal energy from the fuel rod, heating the coolant up. We can increase our coolant's pressure and temperature this way and use it as a propellant. In a sense, a nuclear rocket does the same thing as a chemical rocket. It creates a hot, high-pressure gas, then passes it through a nozzle, increasing its velocity and transferring the momentum from the exhaust to the rocket. Nuclear rockets take a cold coolant and pass it over hot fuel rods, then pass that hot and high-pressure coolant through a nozzle. We can actually get our coolant hotter and faster in a nuclear rocket than in a regular chemical rocket. So, if nuclear engines have a higher exhaust velocity than chemical rockets and are more efficient, why not use them exclusively for rockets instead of relying on chemical rockets to launch our payloads to space? Well, for starters, a high exhaust velocity does not always mean a high thrust. The mass flow rate of a nuclear rocket is simply not high enough to generate enough thrust to overcome gravity. Another major disadvantage of nuclear rockets is that, because they need to maintain a stable neutron population as they change power levels, the throttles must be changed very slowly. A rapid power transient, a rapid shift in the number of neutrons in the reactor, could cause the nuclear rocket to go prompt supercritical and, well, explode. Nuclear rockets are also very heavy. Uranium and lead aren't really known for being super lightweight, and it takes a lot of highly enriched uranium fuel to make a nuclear rocket that's useful for space exploration. So what then are nuclear rockets really useful for if they have so many issues pulling them down? Well, they're still extremely efficient, and since they use water or liquid hydrogen as fuel, they're cheaper to fill up than just about anything else. Using them can be a bit tricky and requires more mission planning. For instance, because they generate so little thrust, you may need to plan multiple burns to get up to escape velocity, as the amount of time required to accelerate up to escape velocity might be so long that you'd have to start burning halfway around your orbit before you even got to your maneuver node. If you don't need a super fast response time, you can make multiple burns over the course of several orbits to get up to speed, and your mission allows for you to use large volume fuel tanks, nuclear rockets are perfect for your advanced deep space missions. I hope you found this video helpful. If you enjoyed it and you would like to see more content like this, please like and subscribe to the channel and leave a comment below with what you would like to see me work on next. I try to take time to read all of your comments and I really appreciate the feedback. Good luck on all your future endeavors and I will see you in the next video.